Now, I have a rather humorous uh, way in which I want to introduce my subject this morning. Uh, and it comes from a, a story about an elderly couple who was sitting at their kitchen one morning. And the actual husband of the, the, of, the, of the two was hard of hearing. He couldn't hear very well. They had lived a pretty long time. And he had managed to go into the kitchen and cook breakfast for his wife. And she was so delighted and so pleased by what he had did. She just had to tell him. She said, honey, I'm so proud of you. And uh, he was hard of hearing, so he said, huh? <laughs> so she, she cleared her throat and she spoke up a little bit louder. She said, I wanted to tell you I'm proud of you. And he said, huh? She couldn't, he couldn't hear. So she decided she would just yell it. She said, I said, I'm proud of you. To which he looked up real quick, startled, and said, well, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> and so I use that joke to introduce to you that hearing, say it after me, hearing, hearing. is important. important. Say hearing matters. Matters. It matters. Now, why are we talking about hearing? Well, the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith is not a product of natural information. Faith is a product of hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, my hearing then is important. The quality of my hearing is important. Now, we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 7, it says a very simple, simple thing, and it's one line of the verse, and this is all we're going to use as a subject matter, and then we're going to jump into what we're going to talk about. It says, for we walk by faith, not faith by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So now, if we are to walk, that is to conduct our lives by faith, then that means that if faith comes by hearing, then I have to live ear first. I do not live sight first. I do not live physical senses first. I do not even live reason first. I live ear to God first. Scripture says, we walk by faith, not by sight, and faith comes by hearing. So my hearing matters. Now notice this scripture implies a few things that it doesn't say bluntly. When it says we walk by faith and not by sight, then it is telling us that sight is not required for faith, but hearing is. Oh, God. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. The eyes are not necessary to live. Now, does that mean you should not believe anything you see? No, 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 no. If you go out of here and you leave this parking lot today and you see a semi-truck coming, you better believe what you see. <laughs> you better accept what you see. You better act like you see it and stop, right, and stay out of the way. So, so the natural eyes, they do uh, serve us in the natural things. But when we're moving beyond the natural realm and we're trying to walk with our Father God your hearing is more important than your seeing. As a matter of fact, your seeing can become a big hindrance. So the scripture says to us, we walk by faith, not by sight, meaning that hearing is important to the believer. That if I'm going to live a life of faith, I'm going to have to understand the importance of hearing. Hearing. Look at your neighbor and say, hearing. How are you hearing? Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 4 when he was in the wilderness being tempted of the enemy. He said that man should not live by bread alone. He was making a quotation out of the book of Deuteronomy. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So man, once again, he lives 
by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, if he is a living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, then what does that make of vital importance once again? His hearing. So he's living by his hearing. Now, we noticed in, in Wednesday night, we talked about this, and I'm just going to touch on it, then we're going to move forward. We noticed where Jesus used the phrase after many of his teachings, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Now, meaning that when Jesus was talking about hearing, he was not just speaking about being able to pick up sound with your ears. That's one aspect of hearing. That's the first measure, the first level of hearing. But Jesus was speaking about spiritual ears. He was talking about the ability to conceive, the ability to understand, the ability to grasp a concept of what is heard. Because how many of you know you can sit and hear a lot of sound, but if you don't ever come to a point of understanding what goes in your ears, it does you no good. And so Jesus says, if you have capacity to hear what I am saying, let him hear. And so this morning, we want to work on our capacity to hear. Because what we're going to find out in the scripture as we walk through this message is that the quality of your life is, it, oh my God, the quality of your life will be determined more than anything else by the quality of your hearing. The quality of your hearing. It can't just be hearing only or in the generic because people hear a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> they hear a whole lot of things, things that they think are God, that are not God. But we want to hone in on this in Scripture. Once again, as I started this out Wednesday night, we want to make sure we have a biblical foundation for faith. Because I've come to discover that sometimes we call a lot of things faith that isn't faith. A lot of times we're taking chances. We're taking risk. We're doing things of our own reasoning and calling it faith. We're into presumption and we're into error and we're calling it believing God. But once again, as I established on Wednesday night, if you're going to say you're doing something by faith, then you're going to have to tell me first what you've heard. Because faith comes by hearing. Now, it's your life. You can live it the way you want to live it. You can do with it what you want to do with it. But if you step out there and you didn't hear something, at least be honest enough to tell all of us you were just taking a risk. Don't call it faith if you didn't hear first. Write this down and do not forget it. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith begins where the will of God is known. I can't say I'm in faith until I have heard and understand it to be God's will. Right? I've got to either A have a promise from the Word of God, or B, I've got to hear from the Spirit of God that illuminates the Word of God to my spirit. And I have to have a word in here, in my heart. So either it's going to be Logos, or it's going to be Rhema. I've got to make sure, though, first and foremost, that I hear. See, so much activity in the life of the believer is done without hearing. We don't hear first. We don't open our ears to hear. Or we're hearing stuff in the audible outside external ear, but we're not hearing in the spiritual ear. We're not conceiving. And so the scripture says the just, all of us, shall live by faith, and we walk by this faith, this ability to hear and believe God's word. I want you to flip over to Mark chapter 4. And this is where we're going to jump into the message. That was all just introduction. I wanted to kind of catch you up from Wednesday night. And like I said, you can, you can go back and, and listen to that message and really glean from that message the importance of what faith is and how faith comes. But we're going to talk about something this morning to kind of help you uh, sharpen your hearing. Because there's something Jesus introduces to us in his teaching that I think is vitally important for us if we're going to live a life of faith. And a life of faith is the life that we all are supposed to be living. 
And so it would behoove us to understand this. Mark chapter 4, we're going to start with verse number 23, where Jesus uses this phrase again. He says, if any man, man have ears to hear, let him hear. Verse number 24, and he said unto them, take heed what you hear. Take heed what you hear. Now, I want you to get ready to underline this word. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Next verse. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, notice what it says. Take heed what you hear. With what measure, the King James says, you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Underline the word measure. Measure. This is an interesting word used in Scripture, and it's not just used here in the New Testament in Jesus' teaching. Jesus uses it often, but it's also used in Paul's teaching. This word measure is used in different contexts and in different subject matter. But in this particular instance, I want to underline its and underscore its importance to you when it comes to your hearing. Because here Jesus implies that it's one thing to hear something and it's another thing to measure it. It's one thing to pick up sound and it's another thing to measure something. So Jesus says, take heed what you hear, what measure you give to it is the measure you'll get back from it. And the word measure is the Greek word metron, from which we get the word meter or metric or metric system. It literally means an instrument of measure, like a, like a ruler or a tape measure. What most believers do not understand and I brought this simple illustration in here this morning to, to work it just to show you. Is that you are determining what you receive from God. God is living in the measure that you've given him. So Jesus says, take heed what you hear. Because what measure you give to it is the measure I'm going to use to return it into your life. See, most people believe that in, they have an erroneous idea of God's sovereignty. And they almost feel sacrilegious. When, when, when they don't say, well, God knows everything, does everything, and if God wants it done, he's going to do it, and if he doesn't want it done, it's not going to get done. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's satanic gospel. See, that Satan, and we're going we're to learn a little bit about him in just a minute, but that Satan misconstruing the sovereignty of God. The Scripture says this. The Scripture says that God is no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean God doesn't care uh, about, uh, he doesn't take into account people's positives or negatives to some degree? But him being no respecter of person is more akin to what we did one, one year in this church. One year in this church, we had a turkey giveaway for Thanksgiving. Well, we gave away turkeys, Right? And in our giving away of turkeys, we were no respecter of persons. What did that mean? That means that everybody that wanted a turkey, it didn't matter who you were. If you showed up as long as the turkeys lasted, you got a turkey. Nothing else was taken into account. All you had to do was show up and you got a turkey. So really whether or not you got a turkey was more or less on you. <laughs> so when God says he does not respect persons, he's saying, I simply use whatever measure people give me. 
So if you show up to church one time a week, and you measure God short, slight in your life, you don't measure what you're hearing of his word. You don't measure the ministry that you're getting from his word. Then this great big old God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think has to navigate within a foot's worth of measure in your life. He would do so much more. And you cry out, God, why aren't you doing more? <laughs> He says, because you only measured me out of foot. So Jesus says this, it's strange to the carnal mind, it's strange to the religious ear. It's not used to hearing something like this, but Jesus says to them after he does all of his teaching, and he says it over and over throughout the Gospels, if you have an ear to hear, let him hear. In other words, let the man measure what he's hearing. It's not enough just to hear it. You have to measure it. I want you to write down a principle here. Your life moves in the direction of what you measure most. Your life is moving in the direction of what you measure the most. Your life is not moving toward your wishes. Yeah, I'll say that too. <laughs> your life is not moving towards your prayers. Because you can be praying, but if you're not measuring, I doubt very seriously you believe in anything you pray anyway. It's just a crapshoot. You, you, you're going before God rolling dice. Right? So, so there's a lot of religious practice in the body that causes us to fall short of the promise of God. Then God gets the black eye like he's not treating his children according to what he said. But see, there's this little law called the law of measure that I'm teaching you this morning that really answers the whole dilemma as to why we don't see more of God. It's because the believers have him boxed into a small measure. So what we got to do is we got to learn how to elongate the measure. Your life is moving in this direction of what you measure most. I want you to flip over to Proverbs chapter 4. Y'all don't mind a little Bible study on Sunday morning, do you? Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 20. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20 is going to give us a greater insight into this law of measure, which, is, which can also be called the law of receiving. How you receive. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, what you measure is what will be measured back to you. So in other words, your receiving is in your measuring. <laughs> your receiving is in your measuring. Now look at this. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. He says, my son, attend, underline that word attend, or give attention, or in other words, measure. My son, you could say it this way, my son, measure my words. Incline your ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Watch this. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues or the spring or the fountain of life. Now, this word is a very interesting word in this, in this text, in verse 23. When it talks about issues, the Hebrew word means a starting point, a source, like a fountain or a fountainhead. You've ever gone to one of those fountains, you see the little fountainhead down in the fountain and it spews the water out, right? Because that's the source that the water's coming from. So when it's talking about guarding your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, it's saying to you that your heart is the fountain or the starting point of your life. It's saying that out of your heart is coming your life. One of the words that is a part of the definition of this in the Hebrew language is the word extremity or border. 
Or in other words, out of the heart come the borders of your life. Your limitations, your borders, the extremity, the extremeness of your life, the area, the real estate of your life starts in your heart. Starts in your heart. Now, what does the Bible say before it gives us that nugget in verse 23? It says, my son, attend, incline, give attention. Child of God, you have to be very selective about what you are measuring. You see, one of the troubles that the church has, one of the troubles that believers are having in our lives is that we measure, but we measure the wrong stuff. We come to church once a week. That's about it. Some of us, we come twice. (laughs) And we are exposed to the teaching of the Word. Now, some of us, we have devotion, so we read at home. We study at home. Then there's some of us who don't. It's not how we measure it. We get what we get when we come to church, and we don't eat anymore, right? But now, that's how we measure. And so, God says in His Word, according to the law of measure, what you give me, what you measure, That's the measure of faith, virtue, ability, power that's going to come back to your life. So my walk with God is going to be limited by my measuring. Now, here is what we also do. We then, outside of the Word, we get on social media. We read magazines. We watch TV shows, and sometimes we we do it every day. It's a daily practice. I mean, you don't, some of us, we wake up, we roll over, we hit the alarm clock, and we check social media. We don't open the Bible. Have I witnessed here? That's the Baptist coming out of me. (laughs) And so not only do we do do this on a daily basis, many of us do it all day on a daily. Then all day on a daily turns into weekly. Then all day on a daily turns into weekly into monthly. You look up and over the course of a few months, you have measured the world's information. And you just keep measuring. And you keep measuring every sitcom, every Netflix series. Uh huh, uh huh. Have I witnessed? All the social media stuff. You all on stuff you ain't got no business watching. Chasing gossip and mess and slander all over the place. Huh? And so you keep measuring it. You're not getting your information about relationship from the Word. You're measuring BET. So now you're wondering why is your marriage struggling? Why are we fussing? Why are we going through what we're going through? I'll tell you why you're going through what you're going through. Because you're measuring the wrong thing. You're giving all of your attention. Now look at it. Look, 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 look. Look at the law of measure. Look at the law of measure. You measured God small. Watch this, though. But you measured Satan great. Now, according to the law of measure, what you measure is what is measured back to you. So if I measure the devil big, Look at the real estate I've given him to move in my life. And then you stand up and you come to the church and you come to the pastor and you sit down and you want a counseling session and you say, Pastor, I'm being attacked. 
The devil is attacking me. I'm under a spiritual attack. But I'm, I'm telling you, I've heard this so many. We're getting attacked in our marriage and attacked in our finances. We're getting attacked in my body. I'm getting attacked in my mind. I'm getting attacked in my children. Child of God, I posit to you, you are not being attacked. You have measured out the wrong person. You've spent your life measuring secular thinking. Some of us put more faith in a Cosmo article than we do in chapter and verse in our Bibles. You all on websites trying to find out what you need to do to get a man. <laughs> and this book is telling you how you need to get a man or a woman. But you don't measure the book. You don't measure the book. So you, 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 you measure what you're getting online. So when you measure that, that's the measure that comes back to you. So no wonder he'll knucklehead. No wonder she crazy. See, that's why you're battling with alimony and child support and all this stuff. You measured the wrong thing. So Jesus says, Jesus said, <laughs> Jesus said, what you give me, that's what you're going to give. So I'm trying to figure out how to get Christian people, not the world. I ain't worried about the world. I, I love the world. I'm trying to get them saved. That's, that's, that's my whole interest in the world is to love them. But the believers, you see, 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 it's one thing when some stuff gets started. Yeah, Lord. It's one thing when some stuff gets started and the world get a hold to it. And they start gossiping, and they talking, and they're spreading rumors and talking this and talking that and down and dogging people and slandering and backbiting. It's one thing when the world does it. Yeah, let, 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 let the world do what they do. But it's a whole different thing entirely. When the believers are out there measuring it right alongside the sinner. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? It's because we do not measure the word that we hear. For far too long in church, we've come to services, we sit in churches, we listen to the preachers and say, Oh, that was good. Oh, he prayed. Oh, 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 he prayed. Oh, oh, he prayed. Oh, he prayed. You need to come hear my pastor. He prayed. Oh, he prayed. He preached, he preached, but the person that heard the message didn't measure it. So when Monday morning came, huh? Nobody was acting on what they said was so good. You see, I've learned a little thing. I've learned, I've learned a few things in ministry now that I've been preaching for a while and I've grown up and I've gotten older. See, I've learned that I, I, don't, I don't judge how effective my ministry is by people's excitement. I've learned that. I'm like, you know what I do? I, I judge whether or not I was really on it by how many times people want to hear it. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, because I'm judging by whether or not people measure what they're hearing. So, the law of measure says my life moves in the direction of what I measure. So if I measure Satan big, if I measure ungodliness big, my life moves in the direction of my measure. And so consequently, my behavior then keeps pace with what I've been measuring. See, this is why I tell people it's not about being holier than thou. It's not about do's and don'ts. But there's a reason why you don't listen to everything. Yeah. There's a reason why you don't watch everything. There's a reason why there's certain, that, 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 I'm telling you now, child of God, let me, let me help you now, because a lot of people are like, well, pastor, I don't, I don't, I don't see nothing wrong with, 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 with every now and again, you know, listening to a little, little bit of this and a little bit of that. 
I don't think there's nothing wrong with listening to a little secular music here and there and, and listen to this and listen to that. Look, look, nobody's trying to put you in hell over your, your song list. Your playlist ain't going to send you there. But what your playlist will do is will influence what you measure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So while it may not send you to hell, it will bring hell into your life. <laughs> you ever notice, you, you remember when you was young, when you was young and immature, especially you ladies, I'm finna get all up in y'all business. When y'all was dating in high school and stuff, and, <laughs> and then whenever y'all went through a breakup with somebody, y'all go in your room, you put your headphones on to turn your radio on, and what do you listen to? You listen to some of the saddest <laughs> breakup music you could find. Your heart all broken. And you listening to, oh, he broke my heart. Baby, 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 why you break my heart? I'm better than her for you, baby, baby. Oh, baby, baby. And you sit there, and all, and all you wanted to hear, all you wanted to measure was what was in agreement with your pain. Right? That's what you did. That's what you did. And when you came out of that place of breakup and out of that pain, you had that song with you. And you ain't going to never get hurt like that again. Ain't nobody going to ever do me like that again. And you're sitting there and you measure this stuff, and then you go through a series of bad relationships. (laughs) Because you're measuring the wrong stuff. See, this is my conversations with people. You don't listen and get in conversations with everybody. God bless some of you, but have, have the courage and the strength to stop getting into tit for tats with people on social media. Come on. Come on. It ain't worth it. You can't win nothing on now. People crazy. They don't, they, don't, they don't even want truth. They don't want to hear it. They're not reasonable people. And you all on there trying to fight back and forth with folks and chase stuff down and get back. What, what are you doing? No, no, don't measure that. Don't give your attention to that. Man. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, I don't fly that low. You got to come on up here to get me. Yeah, I'll choke you out. I fly so high the air is thin. You, 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 got, you got to come up high. You got to come up high, real high. You try to chase, you go, you, you ain't, you ain't going to better give me. Because I don't dupe that low. I don't swing that low. I'm an eagle. I don't deal in chicken stuff. I don't, I don't stay on the ground. Mama didn't raise me in no barnyard. There ain't no chicken. I'm an eagle. <laughs> you got to learn how to measure what you hear. I want you to turn over to Mark chapter 4. Turn back to Mark 4. I did this on purpose. I preached this message somewhat backwards. I introduced what is in the latter part of Mark 4 on purpose to go back to what is in the beginning part of chapter 4. Because it's connected. So when it comes to measuring the words you hear, when it comes to measuring what you hear, there are a few hindrances that come to all of us. And how you deal with this will determine how you measure the word. Remember, remember, this is important because this is a spiritual law I'm talking about here. This isn't, this isn't just good talking. What you measure... God is using to measure back to you. That's what he's using. That's what he's using. It's not deep, and it puts a lot of responsibility on you and me. But that's what faith is, right? That's what having authority is all about. We we shout about having authority, and then when God puts responsibility on us, we tripping. We're like, "Oh, oh, oh, Lord, I want you to do it. No, that's not how it works. (laughs) <laughs> He's no respecter of person. So he says, you got to measure this. If you want me to work on your behalf, you got to measure it. you got to measure what you're hearing, right? So there are a few hindrances, 
And Jesus outlines these hindrances in the first part of Mark chapter 4. But we're going to move into the middle part where he explains it. He's talking about the sower sowing the word. And he's talking about the word being spoken to you or the word from the, from the word of God itself. You reading it and understanding it. There are a few things that happen to all of us that we're going to have to learn how to overcome if we're going to truly measure God's word properly and get the results in our lives. Now, let's look at this beginning with verse number 14, Mark 4 and 14. It says, the sower soweth the word. And we're going to read all the way down to verse number 20. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown or the word is heard. But when they have heard the word that was sown, wait a minute, let me see here. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they've heard the word, immediately they receive it with joy or gladness. But they don't have any root in themselves. And so they endure for a little while or a little time. And afterwards, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, entering in... <clears throat> choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground. They hear the word, they receive it, and they bring forth fruit, some 30, 60, and 100 fold, the King James says. He says, so there are people that hear the word and Immediately, <laughs> Satan comes and takes what was sown. It gives the, um, it paints the picture in Scripture of seed being thrown on the topsoil. Not even buried, just thrown on the topsoil, not, not buried underneath the earth. And the birds come and they, they eat it up. So in other words, the word didn't even get in. Didn't get in. And these are people who never give any attention to what they've heard. These are people who never, ever measure it at all. Church is a religious practice. Bible reading is a religious practice. It, they hear it with these ears. <laughs> they get exposed to it, but they never give any attention to what they're hearing. They never measure it at all. And because they never measure it at all... It's taken away from them. So in other words, they're right back where they started before they heard anything. It does them no good. Secondly, there are those who are sown on stony ground. Now, people with stones in the ground, <laughs> right? These are people, the word is sown, but they don't have any root. They don't have any root inside of themselves, so they endure just for a short amount of time. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the word, they quit. Or in other words, these are people who cannot stand the mental stress of standing on what they heard. They can't take it. They heard a word about their prosperity, and then their washing machine broke down. And then they just, oh, they threw. They threw at God. They threw at the word. They threw at everything. They heard a word about God saving their home, and their son said something stupid and did something bad in school, and oh, they're through. They're done. Something happens, and they're finished with the word they're standing on. They get hit with a contradictory circumstance, and they quit. They're offended. They're off the word. They can't handle the persecution and the affliction. They can't handle the mental darts that the enemy shoots at you. When you have a word from God. So God said he was going to do this and God said he was going to do that. And they excited too. They received the word with joy. Oh, you can't beat them running around the church. There he go. 
You can't beat them dancing. You can't beat them shouting. You can't beat them getting excited. And I'm not condemning you. God bless you. I love all of that. But you can't beat them getting excited about the word. But the moment something happens that contradicts the word, you finish. And Jesus said, that's a sign that your heart has no depth. Just like a, 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 a ground, a patch of ground with stones in it. You can't plant nothing in it. You can't get it in there. Because there are rocks in the soil. Then there is that ground that is thorns. Thorny ground. <laughs> they have the cares of this world. Deceitfulness of riches. Lust of other things. Entering in. Choke the word. Look at what Jesus says here. These are people who have divided interest. They hear the word, but their mind is on everything else. They hear the word, but they're pursuing all kinds of other stuff. They hear the word, but they're chasing money. They hear the word, but they're chasing skirts. They hear the word, but they're after success and fame and popularity. They hear the word, but their mind is divided. Their attention is divided. So they cannot properly bring forth fruit of the word because their attention has been divided. They're more concerned about likes. They're concerned about their social standing. They're caught up in the cares of this world. And notice Jesus said, these things entering in choke the word. Or in other words, in these people, it has been planted. And it would bring forth fruit. But some stuff you let in chokes it out. Meaning that if you wouldn't have let it in, you would have brought forth some fruit. It was working for you. You were on your way to what God said. You were on the path of purpose. But why did you let that other stuff come in and choke the word? <laughs> you see, you were doing good. So many people, so many, so many young men. I see so many young men. And young men, when they get messed up over relationships, they get messed up. I know the ladies talk about how they get messed up, but I'm telling you, men can get messed up. I've seen some brothers just, oh, bless them. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, they, they, they ain't going to never love again. They, they just so hurt, they ain't, ain't going to never do it again. They, but uh, people can be going along real great. They got, they got a purpose. They got their eyes on their purpose. They have, a, they have their heart. It's been illuminated with the understanding of what God has created them to do, called them to do, called them to be. They get on the road, and they're caught up in the care of having somebody in their life. <laughs> Worried about, I'm getting old. Worried about what you look like to others. And all of a sudden, these things start to grow like thorns. You've seen it in a garden when you've planted a good row of, of seed, and then there's some weeds start growing up around the good planting. And if you let those weeds keep growing, they choke the seed that you intended to grow. And all of a sudden, you're doing good, and you let some relationship come in and just choke it out. Look at somebody say, cut the weeds. Cut the weeds. Cut the weeds. See, this is what you ought to be doing throughout your entire life. You ought to leave this place today, and you ought to find everything that's growing up, choking what God planted on the inside of you, and you ought to go to cutting it. Cut them. Click. Cut the weeds. What did Jesus say? If your right arm offends you, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. <laughs> Now, did that mean you're supposed to be running around plucking out your eyes and cutting off your arms? No. It, it, it meant Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was talking about you being decisive about separating yourself from and separating from you things that are offending you, things that are choking out God's purpose and plan for your life. It's keeping you from being able to measure. And when you would measure the word right, you would measure it right, you got this stuff choking you. 
You would measure it right, but then you got these things coming at you, and you can't, you can't stand the persecution. So you... And so you can never give God the room he needs to work in your life the way he wants to work in your life because you keep falling prey to all of this different stuff, choking out your ability to measure him. When are you going to measure God? When, 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 when are you going to make the decision that, you know what, for the rest of my life, I'm going to give God room to be God. I'm going to give him room in my finances, room in my marriage, room in my family, room in my purpose, my destiny. I'm going to measure him. Because he says, with what measure I use, that's what I'm going to get back. And I want a whole lot. I want a whole lot. And see, this is the problem with us. Now, our prayer list is about this long. Yeah, your wish list about that long. Matter of fact, I could probably back all out there in the hallway <laughs> to get your real wish list, what you want, what you say you want. But that's not how we've measured him. We're asking God to fulfill a prayer list that long with that much measure. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll be nice. <laughs> No, you say be honest? You say be honest. <laughs> Come on, God. Do it, God. Come on, God. I know you can, God. Can't you see I'm believing you, God? I'm confessing, God. I'm speaking, God. <laughs> That's it. And so we live our lives shorting God on how we measure him. And then we're wanting more from him. I challenge you today, be selective. And then become intentional about how you measure what you are getting from the word. You see, this is why, this is why, man, see, this is why God told Joshua when Joshua was getting ready to go into the, into the land, and he told him, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. And he said, but this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, day and night. What was he trying to tell Joshua? Joshua had never led. He was not a leader of a nation. He had been serving under Moses. This was something new to him. It was big. And God said, this is what you're going to do. I'm going to be with you. The same way I was with Moses, but there was something you got to do for me. God said, you're going to have to get in that law, and you're going to have to measure it day and night, day and night. See, the law of measure is right there again. You're going to have to measure it because, see, what you measure, that's what he's using. That's what he's using. Christianity ain't deep. It ain't no secret. <laughs> it's not. And see, this is what trips a lot of people out, and they get disgusted because they've been believing this erroneous idea of how God does this, that, or the other, and whether he will or he won't, and when, does, does God do it for some and not for others? No, it ain't that. It's that some people measure, and some people don't. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line of life. You go back in anybody's life significantly where they've been blessed or they're living on a level of victory, those people are measuring the word. You can't do it without it because Satan's going to see to it. He's going to come at you with everything. He's going to check you. He's going to challenge you. So you got to measure this book. you got to measure what you're hearing. This morning, I just wanted to, by the Spirit of God, challenge you to not do church as usual, Right? Yeah, we, we're not involved in church as usual. We're not involved in religion. Now, I, I didn't get into this for religion. I, I'm trying to figure out how to live this life. 
this life. And so when you come across a principle like the law of measure, it takes all of the mystery and the guesswork out of it because now you see, you see it. You see it. You see where you've, you've missed it. You see where you've gone wrong. You also see why we have so many misunderstandings because people think God is just kind of sitting up in heaven waiting to, to do this or that for one or the other. But no, it's what you're measuring. Right now, for your healing, for your finances, for your marriage, for your, for, for your you, you, just everything in your life, your whole life, how do you measure it? I was talking about how Wednesday night a lot of people will come to you and say, Pastor, I want you to pray with me. And, and stand in prayer with me over something or other. And if you ask most of the people, I'm serious, eight times out of the ten, maybe even nine times out of ten, if you ask those people, well, show me in the scriptures what you're standing on. Most people can't produce one. But I just want, I just want you to pray with me. I wouldn't really after anything specifically like, well, you ain't going to get none specifically, so I'm not praying for you. I know this sounds mean, y'all, but, but enough of this religious practice. This, this is what makes people run from church <laughs> because we, they come in here and they see a whole lot of ritual and it's empty. It don't produce no fruit. They're ready to see somebody say, okay, show me how to live, right, and mean it, right? And so we got to take the word and we got to measure it. I don't want you to ever forget it. I want you to go home. And if that's all you measure... I can't even hardly, that don't even look like I'm measuring nothing. Man, that's just, let me see. I can't be that mean. But I want you to go home. And I want you to think about how you've measured God. How you've measured his word in your life. How you've measured his promise. Have you let it get choked by the cares of this world? chasing after things. All that leads to is more frustration. You look up and you've pursued something, you've chased something, only to come away and realize that you wasted a whole lot of time running after it. But the Bible says, if you seek first the kingdom, if you'll measure that, and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. The stuff you're chasing will chase you. The stuff you're after will come into your life. But he says, first, you got to measure my kingdom, my word. What measure you give God is the measure he uses to give back to you. Stand up on your feet.